Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to assume from how our emails ended abruptly that it's going to be the same square. Uh, the same what? I, I missed something there. But yeah, I sent an email like a couple days ago. Do you remember it? Yes. Regard, uh, remember you sent it. This is Gage, right? No, this is Rodell. Oh, sorry. Then no, I don't. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry, I'll pull up my email real quick so you don't have to re-explain to me. I also wrote an email about the test asking, did I miss something? That oh, I no, no. Back? Yes, I, I guess y'all, I see it now. Okay. Yeah, the test, uh, I was supposed to go open it up on Friday, but we didn't finish Chapter 24, so I decided to hold off. So I'm going to open it today and at least give you till, well, I'll probably give you till Sunday uh, to get it done. Okay, thanks. I just I must have missed that part. I did the practice test and everything. I just missed that part. Gotcha. And Rodell, I did see yours about uh, lab attendance. I I replied. It says I replied, uh, but I got three of them from you. So that makes me think maybe you didn't get the uh, reply. Just remember, uh, I I'll, I'll refer you to what I had said before, which is attendance depends on two things. You you get a fifty percent attendance grade if you're there for a, a sufficient long enough period of time during lab and uh that gives you 50 of the 100 points uh normally it's on the order of 30 minutes or so which is what it takes uh, and then if you uh turn in your lab report on time you get the other 50 so if you just got a 50 it might not be for attendance it might have been for not turning in the lab on time uh, uh i i did turn my lab on time it said okay. the date due date was for last year so if it says late then oh then that could be the yeah problem. Yeah, yeah i'll double check that so yeah uh in fact i remember yeah i remember you mentioning that i think it was you someone mentioned to me that the due date was last year so that's that's my problem i will i will go in and check that uh normally i do that when we're doing when we're having lab days so during lab i go in there after i let you guys loose and i start going in there and looking for oddities on dates and i pull up the rosters uh the the zoom reports and tell me who was there and that sort of stuff so i'll correct that uh when i get there that day and i'll probably find it on my own even without you but if you uh if you want to remind me that's cool you can remind me then but like i said i will check it when i go to lab i'm gonna make it uh, i did receive that email you you asked if i got a 50 or a zero and i just said, said i got a zero in for some reason okay yeah that's yeah that, that shouldn't have been yeah, especially since you turned it in on time, so that's no problem. And uh, there was also a lab where I told you guys you could split. That was on the intro to Excel. So if it was that one, and I, I marked you for missing uh, at all. I think that was the intro to Excel. Yeah, uh, that one I told people they didn't have to stick around for. So if I gave you a attendance grade of less than 50, uh, then then yeah, you something happened and, and I screwed up. So I'll, I'll fix that as well. Good. Yeah, I'll take care of that, Rodell. Sorry about it. Uh, and yeah, I saw like three new emails. <laughs> so I knew I replied to one. So I must must not have replied to all of them. I apologize. I'll get better. Uh, anything else? Anybody has any questions or anything? Um, one more thing. Yeah, go ahead. I'm Christy, you're next, babe. Sorry, I said babe. I don't know where that came from. Just talking. Uh, so I'm, I've been there. looking at our. Uh, mastering course and apparently there's like three chapters doing the 27th should we worry about that uh three chapters and uh yeah so we have we've only covered chapters 21 22 23 and 24 those are the only due dates that are remotely uh accurate uh there will be more dates to come along like ideally i'm going to finish 24 today and start 25 and if that's the case, then 25, sometimes a day will be accurately posted for due dates. But just remember, if we haven't covered the chapter, and you should always know what chapter we're in, uh, if we haven't covered the chapter uh, at all, then there's no reason to think the due dates are right. You're was, yeah, I, I had a similar question because it's like 25 through 28, I'll say the 27th. But yeah, yeah, like you said, we haven't covered those yet. Yeah, just remember that just because I have to put it in and it won't let me put them in without certain dates. And I use them as a marker to remember because we jump around a little bit in this course. So I put them all up there and it just sort of sneezes them in at certain dates. Uh, Christian, you can go ahead now. 
Um, I was going to say, uh, do you still take late labs? I turn mine in like a day late. Yeah, absolutely. My, my rule is basically up to a week late, you're going to lose 10 points. Uh, but uh, basically, you want to make sure you turn it in before the next labs do, or otherwise it's going to count as two weeks late, and that goes to 25 points. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I'll check that. I'm sorry about calling you, babe. Uh, a friend of mine, two doors down, got me into basically referring to every female as babe, and I don't mean it derogatorily or anything, but I certainly never mean to say it to my students. So, sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, Feel free to call me butthead or whatever. That's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, now, the other person that asked a question before Clarence, did I, uh, you, your question was spotty. I couldn't hear all the audio. So did I correctly answer your, or fulfill your questions that you had? Can't remember who it was. All right, well, I guess we'll go ahead on then. Uh, oh, um, I had a question. Yes, go for it, Vanessa. Um, I uh, sent an email. I think it might be one of the ones you haven't responded to yet. It's okay, no rush or anything. I know you're busy. Um, but I've been trying to rewatch some of the lectures you post, and uh -huh. every like from the lecture, like from the eighth to like the sixteenth. Every time I click on them, I get rerouted rerouted to a screen that says the video doesn't exist. Okay, yeah, there's one of them I, I discovered. Well, actually, it might even be two of them now. Uh, I set one to upload on Friday night, and I got it to like 97%, and then I went and left the computer. I got, I came back Sunday night and noticed it said it failed. And I did another one last night, or yeah, I think it was last night, and I don't know if that one failed or not because I found out my computer had crashed. So there might be a couple of YouTube links that don't exist now. The one thing to do is when you click on it, it'll, it'll it has that little title across the little gray bar where the window is supposed to come in, and it'll say something about cannot directly link from YouTube uh, to YouTube or something like that. If you click the little gray box inside of, yeah, of the yeah. title, that sometimes takes you there. But if it if it's not there, it's just not there. And there there's I know at least one's not there. Uh, hopefully I will check all the other links. If you, uh, when you do click on one, please send me the exact name of the link and uh, I will fix that as soon as I can. I got two okay. videos oh, yeah. going out today. <clears throat> yeah, I can do that. Um, okay. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't something like on my end or anything. No, nah, it pro probably isn't. And I want to make sure y'all get that. Uh, I, I get that worked out before you start taking your tests. Like I said, I'm probably going to open the test today, but I'm going to give you at least till Sunday to get it done. Thank you. No problem. And similar to the last one, we'll have three tries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three tries on your highest counts. Uh, remember, uh, you want to probably take it soon so you don't forget because it's really easy to forget. And I don't want to give you guys a zero on a test. So let's give that a try. OK. All right. So let me think. Uh, Okay, let me think. I'm going to. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start into chapter 24, trying to finish that up. I got a couple types of examples I'd like to uh, work with you guys. And then if time allows, I'll jump back into 25 so we can get started on that. 25 is actually a really straightforward, uh, fairly easy chapter. It's on currents and resistance. So that's where we introduce Ohm's law, which you probably have done. I think y'all already started doing that in lab. Uh, so it'll make a little bit more sense to you. Uh, I'm gonna start off with an example where we're gonna take a, a capacitor and we're gonna add a dielectric to it. Now dielectric is a really, really fancy word, but it really just means a non-conductor, something that doesn't readily conduct charge, but it does do things as we'll show after this first example. I'll show you that basically there's some uh, some molecular things that occur and we have ways of, of accounting for them mathematically. And uh, I'll show you how to do that as well. So there's two capacitor type examples that I really want you to work. Uh, the other one uh, is a capacitor example that I didn't work, but I think it's easy enough for you guys. Uh, your book has one where basically you take two capac uh, capacitor plates and you pull them apart and you calculate basically what the change in potential energy is. And uh, that's, that's a, a good problem. And you can calculate the work done. 
and on it and and you'll uh, find out something very interesting it can tell you for instance how much force it takes to pull them apart it, it's, it gives you an idea of how to go about uh calculating how much force it takes to push a dielectric into a capacitor all sorts of cool stuff like that so i definitely want you to look over that example even though i haven't done that there are examples like it on my youtube channel from some time ago remember i keep that i try to keep that document that says uh, my youtube videos that document i try to keep updated and you can tell whether it's not it's been updated by the date that's stamped in the name so uh, if you look in the important <clears throat> important links and documents there's a, a little text document .txt, that has all the titles of my videos and it has the actual urls to them on youtube so you can actually flish through those and if you'll notice when you get to the physics course the same is true about astronomy but the physics course is a relevant one right now it starts with physics 241 it goes in order and then it starts into physics 242 and goes in order so uh you guys should be looking for early in physics 242 which means you should be a little bit more than uh halfway down uh on the list and you'll start to see you know like uh, infinitely long wire or uh a, a dipole moment or stuff like that okay so let me start by talking to you about a capacitor what i'm going to do is i'm going to imagine a capacitor and then I'm going to uh, actually take that capacitor with its with its dielectric in it and imagine pulling the capacitor out. So let me give you some data on the actual capacitor. And what we're going to try to do is pretty much figure out everything we can about the capacitor, then pull out the dielectric and figure out what those quantities are now. So that's that's sort of the crux of the problem. Uh, rather than than write it out in long term sentence form, I'm just going to give you the data on it and tell you that we're going to calculate everything we can about it. Uh, with a dielectric in it, then we're going to pull out the dielectric very, uh, very carefully so that you don't steal charges and weird stuff like that. And then we're going to calculate those same things so we can see how, how the actual uh, capacitance, charge, voltage, all that stuff changes. Okay. Uh, and some of it, you know, of course, doesn't change, but that's sort of the whole point is I just want you to understand that. So let's turn on my document cam or let's just, you know, turn my camera off for some unknown reason. Well, you know, that's what happens when you're 50. <laughs> okay, so now I've got the document here. I think I've got it zoomed out enough, but not too far. Hopefully that's the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect a, a uh, capacitor to a battery, and I'm going to imagine that battery or that power source is a 100-volt source. So we're going to have a voltage across the capacitor that is 100 volts. So the first thing I'm going to write down, if I can ever find my pen, is that the voltage across this capacitor. So this is the capacitor. It's got some kind of dielectric in it. So it looks like a Pop-Tart sandwich. So <laughs> the voltage across it is gonna be 100 volts. I'll call that 100.0 volts. I'm going to say the dielectric constant for the capacitance is 4.00. I'm going to say that uh, the area of the capacitor, remember that's the area of the, of the actual disk, that's going to be uh, 4.0 square meters, which is pretty large. And that's two meters by two meters, basically. So that, that's a pretty large uh area capacitor and i'm going to say the distance of separation between the plates is in fact 2.00 millimeters and i should put another zero in here just to make sure we can at least get three sig figs so i'll put another zero in the 4.0 that's not very clear is it there you go that's a little better so that's 4.00 even though it looks god awful Okay, uh, what else? I think that's about all I need. And what I want to do is I want to calculate what the capacitance is, what the charge will be, what the electric field will be, and what the potential energy is. So I want to say, what is the capacitance, the charge, the electric field, and I want to find the potential energy U. And then I'm going to pull the capacitor out and try to find out the same stuff. Now, uh, the important thing that you need to know about this actually exists in writing on a very specific page. Yes, it's on the middle of page 639.
And what Giancoli is doing is he's giving you a very specific series of uh, events that occurred when you do an experiment. So basically, if you take and connect a battery to a capacitor, and then you alter it by adding a, a capacitor, I mean, by adding a dielectric or something like that, remember C, the capacitance is equal to Q over V. So when you go to change the capacitance to, instead of K, you're going to go from C, excuse me, instead of C, you're going to go from C to CK. That's how the capacitance changes. That means the capacitance is going to increase. Well, if you actually do that uh, while it's connected to a battery, then the voltage has to remain the same. And from that, I think you can realize, oh, if the capacitance goes up, the number, the amount of charge must go up by a factor of K. That's one of the experimental results. Now, the other experimental result is if you disconnect the capacitor from the battery, uh, then no charges can flow back and forth, but the voltage is free to do whatever happens. So in that case, uh, when you actually disconnect it from a battery, the charges can actually change uh, or can't, cannot actually change, but the voltage can. And in fact, what we find is the voltage goes down by a factor of K when you do that experiment. So if you put V over uh, K down here, you can see that the K would come on top and you still get that capacity. So that's that's the two experimental results that are listed in, in the center of page 639. And that's what we have to use uh, to solve this problem. Or that's some of the ideas we have to employ to solve this problem. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna calculate the capacitance. So we can see uh, A, the capacitance is, uh, it's supposed to be, the dielectric constant, which by the way, your book seems to be calling K. I've always used kappa for that. Uh, that's why I'm writing my K's a little curved, but uh, it doesn't really matter what you call it. The important thing is that you know it exists. Uh, and that's the capacitance. Remember we learned the capacitance earlier was uh, epsilon zero A over D. Now we're just increasing it by a factor of K because that turns out to be what happens when you uh, add a dielectric. Uh, the dielectric remember is something that can be structural. Like if you're gonna take a two meter by two meter a uh, square sheet and roll it up when it's only a couple millimeters apart. And this is supposed to be millimeters, not meters. When it's only a couple millimeters apart, then it's not going to be structurally very sound. Uh, so a dielectric can actually be put in between there and that will actually, you know, give it some support. But not only that, the dielectric might have a uh, larger ability to hold voltage difference without uh, failing. So for instance, air is gonna become ionized at you know, three times 10 to the six volt per meter. That's, a, that's electric field strength. Uh, this dielectric probably is not gonna become ionized until a much higher voltage. So you actually make the thing a little safer that way and other stuff occurs. But this is pretty straightforward. So we're gonna go ahead and calculate this. I'm gonna say my dielectric constant is 4.00. Epsilon zero is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th. That's Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. And then A is going to be 4.00 square meters. Luckily, we already have it in the units that we want. And D, of course, is going to be 2.00 times 10 to the negative uh, 3 meters. So I can calculate that. And when I do so, I'm going to get four times 8.85 e to the negative 12 times four again, and then divided by two e to the negative three. So you can see I've got like three sig figs on everything and everything's multiplying and dividing. So the answer should come out the three sig figs. It's adding and subtracting that make a problem. Uh, so using elect, uh, engineering notation, this is 70, point eight zero one extra digit in other words times 10 to the negative ninth which if you remember from your prefixes micro is 10 to the negative six and then uh nano is 10 to the negative ninth so we can write that as a, a nano farad so this is 70.80 nano farads okay now the charge Remember, charge is just given from C equals Q over V, so Q is just equal to CV. 
So I'm going to take uh, 70.80 times 10 to the negative ninth farads. I could have kept the nanofarads on it, but then I have to track down what it's going to do. Uh, it should become, for, for instance, nanovolts. And we can still see that here, though, but I multiply that by the voltage, 100 point zero volts that's four sig figs this is only three so we're going to get out three sig figs so i'll multiply this 70.8 times 100 and obviously that 7.08 times 10 to the negative six and that's coulombs not farads so notice i could have just kept this nano and when i multiply 100 by seven uh by 70.8 that would be 7,800, or excuse me, 7,080 uh, nanofarads, which would also convert this to 7.08 microfarads. And I keep saying farads, I mean not micro uh, coulombs. Okay, so this is 10 to the negative six coulombs, this is micro coulombs, and that's a zero, not a six. That's pretty straightforward, right? Any questions on that? Now you remember there's a couple of different ways you can calculate E. Uh, for instance, we found that E was actually equal to the voltage divided by the distance uh, of separation. That's actually one expression, right? Uh, and the reason why that came out to be was basically because you know the, uh, the voltage was the line integral of a uniform electric field all the way across here. So it just became V is equal to E times D. And that's also where we get the cool units that we use for the electric field now, which is volts per meter instead of Newtons per Coulomb. But you could also use what we found from uh, doing Gauss's law. And that was that E was equal to sigma over epsilon naught, which sigma remember is just the charge on the capacitor uh, divided by the area. So you could do that calculation as well, but this one's a little easier, so I'm going to do it, but you might want to try just to convince yourself that it's the same. Uh, I'm going to take 100 volts and divide it by 2 times 10 to the negative third meters. And of course, that's pretty easy. And I get 50,000 volts per meter. And really, this was four sig figs. This one was only three sig figs. So I really should be only carrying it this far, volts. So I could write this as 50.00 kilovolts. That's acceptable as well. So our answers so far are 70.8 nanofarads, 7.08 microcoulombs, and 50,000 volts, basically. Uh, the last thing I have to do is calculate the uh, potential energy. And remember, there's a bunch of different ways we can calculate potential energy. I'm going to use U equals uh, 1 half CV squared. So again, I put in the one half, the, I put in the capacitance that I calculated earlier, which will be 70.80 underscore times 10 to the negative ninth farads times 100.0 volts squared. You can see that's going to be multiplying it by 10 to the fourth, basically. So that's going to be like a 10 to the negative fifth and then times one half, but we'll carry it out. So that times 0 0.5 times 100 squared, and I get 354.0 times 10 to the negative 6 joules. Okay. That is the energy stored in this capacitor. And you can see the 10 to the negative 6 is the same thing as a microjoule. Uh, but the important part is we, we now have how much energy is stored in there. So what we're going to do now is we're going to imagine pulling the capacitor out. So part E 
we're going to say pull the capacitor out, or excuse me, pull the dielectric out. Pull out the dielectric carefully. Okay. In doing that, we're going to get part E, which is let's calculate the capacitance again. So the capacitance now would be equal to, and I'll say this is, uh, let's call it C prime because that's a new capacitance, say. Okay. That's going to be the old capacitance divided by the dielectric constant. So I'm going to take the uh, answer that I got before, which is 70.0 or 70.8 underscore zero times 10 to the negative ninth farads. And I'm going to divide it by 4.00. Uh, and that's the dielectric constant. So if I divide that by four, I get 17.7 .7 times 10 to the negative eight. Excuse me, 10 to the negative ninth uh, farads. So again, that's 17.70 nanofarads. So notice it is just one fourth of this, of course. So that's, uh, it did obviously decrease the capacitance. Now you want to say, well, well, what actually happens to the electric field? Well, the electric field uh, will change in some sense, but uh, you, you got to think, wait a second, if the electric field changes, what's causing that? But the battery has been disconnected. So the charge can't change, but the voltage can. So ultimately, uh, what you're going to see is because you're pulling this dielectric out, you are actually allowed to get an even larger uh, electric field. So F is what is the electric field? And the electric field is going to be equal to V over D, but this will be prime. Uh, we'll know the D stays the same, but the voltage is going to be different. And that's because, as we said in that previous experiment, without a battery, with battery disconnected, say, With the battery disconnected, uh, Q cannot change. But V can. And in fact, since the uh, capacitance actually went down, then what we have to see is V must, in fact, go up. So V is going to go up by a factor of the dielectric constant, basically. So that means V prime is going to be equal to K times V. So now we can write E prime is equal to 4.00 times the old voltage, which was uh, 50.00 times 10 to the third volts. And then I'm going to divide that by 2.00 times 10 to the negative third meters. So when I do that, I will say 50,000 times four divided by two e to the negative third. And that gives me in fact, 100 times 10 to the six. Can you move it down? Yes, thank you. Volts per meter. So the electric field strength, if you look back up here, the electric field strength before was, where did I even calculate that? Oh, that was kilovolts per meter, duh. No wonder I couldn't see it. I even made a point to tell you guys that it was volts per meter, but I ended up still writing just volts. So the electric field was 50,000 kilovolts per meter. Now the electric field is, in fact, 100 uh, megavolts per meter, if you want.
So by adding that dielectric in there, we actually increase the voltage. And sort of the reason why we'll see in a second when I start discussing the uh, molecular behavior of a dielectric, uh, but basically just know that by doing this, you can actually increase the electric field uh, or decrease the electric field by putting a dielectric in. And the reason that happens is the dielectric has little molecules or even uh, it might just have atoms themselves. The main thing is it's going to have the ability for those molecules or those atoms to polarize themselves so that the positive end of the molecule or atom will be pointing towards the negative side of the capacitor and the positive side will be pointing towards the other side. Uh, and that's going to happen over and over. So it actually creates an electric field in the opposite direction inside the dielectric. So that's what's going on there. Uh, and we can see now that the new electric field is larger specifically because uh, that, that dielectric didn't reduce it with the back, uh, the back electric field. Finally, the last thing I wanna calculate is part G. I wanna calculate the U and the U is of course one half CV squared again. So I'll say one half. Now the C is 17.70 times 10 to the negative nine farads. And the voltage now, of course, is uh, is actually now uh, bigger than the 50,000 volts. It's going to be, in fact, the, uh, yeah, it's going to be, in fact, 400 volts instead of, uh, ooh, uh, uh, watch this. I, I think I put in the wrong number here, so be careful with this one. Right here, remember the voltage was 100 volts? Uh, I told you correctly that the new voltage would be four times 100, so that's 400 volts. And that's got to be squared. So that result is going to be 0.5 times 17.7 e to the negative 9 times 400 squared. And that gives me 1.416 times 10 to the negative third joules. And this is one extra sig fig there. So you can say it's 1.416 millijoules. Now, uh, back to that electric field, something really ha happened there and I was, stammering a little bit when I saw the number because I didn't expect it to jump from 50,000 to 100 million. And now I re realize why. Uh, do y'all see that I, because I had put my voltage, I mean, my electric field in the wrong units, I had read that as the voltage completely forgetting about the 100. So that's really not correct at all. Uh, what I will do is say, oops. Okay, and now I'll do F again. So again, V prime is going to be equal to K times V, which is 4.00 times 100.0 volts. And that's, of course, 400.0 volts. Then E prime is going to equal V prime over D. So that's 400 Point zero volts over two times 10 to the negative third. Yeah. Thank you. Two times 10 to the negative third meters. Now we can do that. Obviously that's gonna be two something. So 400 divided by two E to the negative third gives me 200.0 times 10 to the third volts, which is 200.0 kilovolts. Okay, that makes a little more sense to me because remember it was, uh, it was 100 volts to begin with, uh, but now we got something, uh, uh, we had 100 volts to, to begin with for the voltage, so that makes more sense. Now I just did the same mistake again, Jesus. Uh, but originally, we also had 50,000 volts per meter was the electric field strength, as you can see right here. 
And in order for that to cause the voltage to go up, you have to actually, uh, the electric field is going to have to go up as well. And what we got was the electric field went up by a factor of four, just like the voltage did. Because obviously 50 times four is 200. So that's finally correct. I apologize for uh, making these errors in my units. I'm going to write these properly up here real quick to make sure we can see them. Okay, so volts per meter, remember, is the cool unit for the electric field. We got 50,000 volts per meter uh, originally, but now we got 200,000 uh, 200, volts per meter. Any questions on that? Sorry, I did not do a good job of that. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to explain to you what happens when you put a dielectric into a capacitor. So uh, just imagine this is a little slice of the capacitor. So there's our positive charges, right? And then what I'm going to do is put this uh, purple dielectric in between them. And I'm going to show a little gap just for clarity so we can look and see what's what. And this is just a small fraction of it. So I really shouldn't be putting the ends on it. And then I'm going to have another plate over here that has the negative charges. Okay. So when you have that, you obviously have a tendency when it was just a plate like this with no dielectric, you had a series of electric field lines that pointed in the direction that a positive charge would want to go. So the E was this. Okay, that was the electric field between these plates before I put the dielectric in there. Now, after you put the dielectric in there, something funny happens. Specifically, if it's a molecule, a polar molecule, then the negative portion will come over here and the positive portion will go over here. And that'll repeat itself and that will repeat itself again. So I got negative, positive, negative, positive. And that's going to repeat itself over and over again because even if it's not a polar molecule, the electrons will spend more time on this side of the nucleus of each of the atoms, say. And that makes the net effect being uh, essentially a polarized material whose polarization makes the electric field point this way. And that little electric field is going to be uh, basically what we call the electric field that's induced. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. So this will sort of be, this will create a little backfield this way and that's going to be called e induced okay any questions on that does that make some sense to you because now this side looks positive and this side looks negative that means positive charges are going to want to go from this side of the dielectric to this side which is the same thing as saying there's electric field here so some of these electric field lines e will go all the way through but other ones will be stopped on uh, by running into another charge. That's really what field lines do is they begin on a positive charge and they end on a negative charge. So that's actually going to cause the electric field and the dielectric, say E, D, this means in dielectric, or with dielectric, I should say. I could have done that like a thousand different ways better, but anyways. So I'm going to say that's the uh, electric field with the dielectric. And what we're arguing is that's going to be equal to this original vector uh, electric field, which I called E0. E Notice I just put a subscript zero on it. That's going to be equal to the electric field E0 minus the electric field that's induced. So the E induced is that little field in there, right? Well, we know from that experiment that I told you that when you actually have it connected, uh, uh, not connected to a battery, then the charge can't change. So the actual voltage changes. And of course, if the voltage changes by decreasing a factor of V, so V 
goes to V over K implies E goes to E over K, right? So now I can say E dielectric, in other words, E with the dielectric inside is equal to E zero minus E induced, but that's also equal to the E zero that we had divided by the K or the kappa. Does that make sense? Now, what that allows us to do is actually solve for the induced electric field. So E induced, again, we're ignoring the ED at this point. We're just taking this portion of the equation and we'll see E induced is actually equal to, it's got a common factor of E zero in it. When I pull this over here, uh, I'll have an E zero and then I pull this over here, I'll say minus E zero over K. So that's gonna be one minus one over K. So that's a key result. And that tells us what the induced electric field is in the dielectric. That's something you can experimentally measure, for instance. And it's something you can use to figure out how much the electric field decreased by just subtracting it from the original electric field. Okay. So uh, given that E zero, was actually equal to sigma over epsilon naught. Remember from, uh, we learned that from Gauss's law. We can now say that E induced would also equal to uh, sigma induced over epsilon naught. And from that, we get sigma induced is equal to sigma times one minus one over K. That's another useful experiment. And alternatively, we could say Q induced is equal to Q. And we could subscript them zeros if we want to, but we really don't need to. One minus one over K as well. So this is the ultimate results that we get is you can express the new charge or the new charge per unit area or anything else in terms of this uh, dielectric constant using that. And that's really is the big conclusion of what happens on a molecular scale with regards to a capacitor when you put a dielectric in or take a dielectric out. You know the rules that basically, uh, since C is equal to Q over V and putting a, capacitor, uh, putting a dielectric in means that the C is gonna be increased by a factor of K. Well, there's only two ways you can do that. You can either multiply Q by K or you can divide V by K. That's the two choices. Now, if the uh, battery has been disconnected, there's nowhere for the charges to run. So they have to stay there. So that can't change. That forces you to divide V by K. And of course, if you're dividing V by K, we know that E is equal to the, the voltage divided by the distance. So obviously you're also dividing the electric field by K. On the other hand, if you leave the battery connected then the V will stay the same, but the charge will actually uh, increase by a factor of K. And uh, from that, you can find that the charge induced in the dielectric is this, or the surface charge induced on the dielectric is this. So we get all sorts of neat little things that can be used. Let's now start the next example. Any questions on any of that now that I have it there? And remember, I, I'm thinking the videos are going to work a little bit better now. I just see Patrick got here. I don't know how long he's waiting there, poor guy. Uh, the videos should be clear, a little clearer now when I post them on YouTube because I'm uh, recording it locally. But that makes it force me back uh, sometimes four hours after class before I can post them. So just be aware of that. So what I want to do now is I want to consider uh, putting a dielectric in a capacitor, but not letting it take up the whole space. Like this dielectric essentially went all the way to the wall of this capacitor and all the way, excuse me, of that plate of the capacitor and all the way to the other wall of the other plate of the capacitor. What happens if I just sort of fill in the middle space, maybe the middle third or the middle half or something like that, or even if I did it the half right against this one or the half right against this one. In fact, it doesn't matter. What matters is more or less how, how large of a fraction of the D is a dielectric. So we're going to actually consider a similar problem than what we just did, but this time we're going to let a dielectric 
uh, sort of fill the space partially. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a parallel plate capacitor. I'm going to say the surface area of the parallel plate capacitor is going to be uh, 400 point zero square centimeters. So we got to deal with that, obviously. I'm going to say the uh, distance between the plates is 1.00 millimeters. And I'm going to say uh, the charge plate or the capacitor is charged up till it had a voltage of V0 equals, let's say, 200 volts. And I'm putting that extra digit so I can always uh, have at least three. Obviously, I'm putting four in there by doing it, but it allows me to avoid the problem of making a decimal place at the end of a number with no nut uh, digit after it. Uh, so the battery is going to be then disconnected, and that means the Q can't change. And when we disconnect that battery, uh, we're going to force a dielectric in there, and the dielectric has a uh, dielectric constant equal to 4.00, OK? So I'm going to say disconnect battery. And I left off a part of my Y. And put in a dielectric. So remember that word dielectric sounds fancy, but it really just means a, an insulator, something that's not conductive. OK, so I'm going to put that in and the area of the of the dielectric. is going to have the same area, 400.0 square centimeters. But its thickness is not going to be the same. I'm going to make its thickness. Actually, that don't work so nicely. Everybody just change this D right here to 2, just so I can make the math a little easier. So I'm going to change this to 2.00. And then I'll say the dielectric is going to be 1.00 millimeters. And I can make that look a little better, so I will. Everybody get that change of D to 2.00 millimeters? Now, the D for the dielectric is half that. So what we're going to have is basically a capacitor, positive plate, negative plate, say, and then a dielectric in the middle that takes up about half the width. OK. But it's going to be disconnected from the battery. That means uh, Q has to equal Q0. In other words, the charge isn't going to change at all. OK. What I want to figure out, so what's the capacitance of the capacitor before I add the dielectric? I want to find out the charge on each plate before I add the dielectric. And I want to find the charge induced on each fa face after the dielectric has been put in. So what I'm going to do is start off with part A. Uh, let's call this C0 equals question mark. So this is the capacitor with no dielectric in it. I just want to know what the capacitance is. So capacitance is equal to epsilon zero A over D. So that's 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. I'm actively trying to write bigger right now. Uh, A is going to be, uh, notice that square centimeters. So that's a bit of a problem. I'm going to write 400.0 centimeters squared. But for each one of those centimeters, uh, there's 100 centimeters in one meter, so I'm going to divide by basically 100 and then divide by 100 again. So I'll say over 10,000. And that'll be meters squared per centimeter squared. That'll fix the units so that they come out right. Okay. And then the D is going to be 2.00 times 10 to the negative third meters. And that's going to give me a capacitance equal to 
8.85e to the negative 12 times 400 divided by, I'm gonna do parentheses here, 10,000 times two times 10 to the negative third. And we can see that's all multiplication and division. We got three sig figs everywhere. So that's gonna give me 177. Point zero is an extra digit times 10 to the negative 12th farads, which I can also write as 177.0 picofarads because 10 to the negative 12th is pico. And I'm going to double check, make sure I didn't misremember. Yes, 10 to the negative 12th is pico, and then the next is femto. So there's one of the answers. We wanted to know what the capacitance is beforehand. So that's what I'm calling C0. And I also want to know uh, what is the uh, charge on each plate before this dielectric is put in. So now I'm going to do B, uh, Q, 0, which actually happens to be the same as Q. Uh, but I'm just putting that to remind us it's it's Q0. This is the charge the plate has before I do anything with the dielectric. But because we disconnected it from the battery, it's not going to change. That's why I'm adding this part just as a parenthetical, if you will. OK, now that Q is just equal to C0 times V0. And the voltage, of course, can change. That's the whole point of disconnecting it. So now I've got the capacitance, which is equal to 177.0 times 10 to the negative 12th farads multiplied by the voltage initially, which is 200.0 volts. So when I do this, I'll say the capacitance times 200 is equal to 35.4. times 10 to the negative ninth, and that's coulombs. So Q0 is going to be 35.40 with an underscore there, nanocoulombs. So that's the stuff that happened before I stuck the dielectric in there. OK, now what I want to do is find out what the induced charge is. So I want to find out what charge is induced on the face of this capacitor because of those uh, polarization of those molecules or atoms or whatever the crap happens inside of there. So I'm going to say C, Q induced is equal to Q zero times one minus one over K. OK. Now, the Q0, and notice I'm not saying the charge has changed on the capacitor. I'm just saying that's the charge that's going to be on the face of the dielectric. So this one will be a negative uh, Q-induced, and this one will be a positive Q-induced. So when I put that in, I get 35.40 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs times 1 minus 1 over 4 which I think you can see is just three-fourths. So it'll be three-fourths times that. And that gives me 26.55 times 10 to the negative ninth coulombs. So Q induced is equal to 26.5 five underscore nanocoulombs. Any questions on that? Now I want to know the electric field in the dielectric. So I'm going to write part D, the electric field in the dielectric. And 
and we'll just call that ED because that is the uh, dielectric electric field. Remember, we had that in our previous derivation. That was the ED right here. So we can tell all I have to do is take the electric field that I had and divide it by K. So that's all I'm gonna do now. Uh, actually, I didn't calculate the electric field of the uh, thing beforehand. I should have done that too. Uh, I'll do that a little bit later. So uh, actually I should go ahead and do that now. So I know the electric field and the dielectric would equal the electric field initially over kappa or K, right? So let's go ahead and calculate what the electric field to begin with was. Now the electric field to begin with would normally be just voltage divided by the distance. And then of course you could also use uh, Q over A as sigma and then put that over epsilon naught. So that would give you the electric field as well. Uh, so let's, let's try one of those. I'm first gonna say E zero is gonna be equal to Q over epsilon naught times A. And that's just from the formula E is equal to sigma over epsilon naught. Does that make sense to everybody? Again, Q over A is sigma. So I'm going to take the charge that I had, uh, which was 35.40 times 10 to the negative ninth coulombs divided by 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared times the area, which we've already learned the area was 400 square meters or square centimeters. And I got to divide that by 10,000. So that's moved the decimal four places to the left. That's one, two, three, zero. Uh, so it's going to be 0 0.0400. And I actually made three zeros as sig figs. And that's the area in square meters, which you can tell is quite small. So now I'm going to take that, if I can turn my calculator on, I'm going to take that 35.4 and I'm going to divide it by parenthesis 8.85 e to the negative 12 times 0.04. All of that in the bottom, that's why I use the parentheses. And that gives me 100,000 volts per meter. That time I remembered it. Yay, clap for me. I, Mr. Younger remembered the meter on the bottom. Okay, so that's the electric field. Uh, and in fact, that should have one extra sig fig there, uh, or that's a non sig fig, but I just want to make sure everybody knew. So this is E0. And I'll put that there, even though I didn't explicitly ask for it. I did, I did actually want to know it. So now I can use that to calculate ED. So ED, whoa, I made the D bigger than the E. That's not cool. All right. So ED is equal to E0 over K. In other words, you're just, just reducing the electric field in that part, in the dielectric itself, that little one half of, a, uh, of the width that part is going to have this weaker electric field. And of course, that weaker electric field is 100.0 times 10 to the third uh, volts per meter over 4.00, which is going to give me 25.00 times 10 to the third uh, volts per meter. And that's going to be ED. So what that means is we actually have an electric field inside of the dielectric that basically points the other direction <clears throat> and is about a fourth as strong. So you can look at it like this and say inside of there, there's an electric field about this size. And then outside of that, of course, is the plates and the electric field out here is this way and it's about 100 kilovolts per meter okay that's sort of important for you to understand as you'll see in the next part i think it's the next one yeah so the next part i want to actually calculate the voltage uh 
across the capacitor. So what part? Uh, Somebody say something. Yep, got a question. Yeah, good part. Uh, in this particular instance, with the equation one half epsilon naught e square e zero square um, would work or wouldn't it? Okay, the one half oh epsilon zero yeah. So that's the energy stored in it. <clears throat> uh in the electric field so that would actually work to figure out how much energy is stored inside you can actually use that to calculate u i just didn't ask for use on this one so okay, yeah it, it, it absolutely does work though okay now what we know is v is equal to the negative integral of e dot dl okay and what we have is we can sort of imagine it going like this it'll be negative integral from let's say uh zero to one millimeter, because the whole distance between here actually is going to have to be zero to half a millimeter, I guess. So let me change that real quick. Uh, I'm going to say a half a millimeter is on each side. So this is a half a millimeter, this is a half a millimeter, and then that's a whole millimeter. So uh, let's mark that distance right here and here. And this distance, of course, is 1.00 millimeters. Okay, so I'm going to go 0 to 0 0.5 millimeters of E0 dot DL minus the integral from 0 0.5 to 1.5 of e d dot dl minus the integral of yes. oh sorry thank you i keep slipping down here and I, i'm not looking at the screen so don't help me so i did from 0.5 which is here to 1.5 which is here now i'm going from 1.5 which is here to two and that's of e zero dot dl and i just put vector symbols over them to remind us it is an actual official dot product but the e and the dl all point in the same direction so really all i care about is that ultimately all this ed is going to be e zero over k so basically we get e zero times 0 0.5 plus e zero over k times one millimeter again plus E0 times 0.5. So ultimately all that's gonna be equal to is E0 times uh, 0 0.5, 0, 0, times 10 to the negative third meters plus 1.00 times 10 to the negative third meters over 4.00 plus 0 0.500 0, 0 times 10 to the negative third meters over K. I mean, uh, excuse me, that's just plain meters, no over anything. And this E0, of course, is what we already have was the 100,000 volts per meter. So I get 100,000. I'll just make a reminder that this is 100.0 kilovolts per meter. So I'm going to do 100 e to the third times parentheses 0.5 e to the negative three plus 0.5 e to the negative three. Notice I took the out of order. I just did these two because they're easy. Now I'm going to say plus parentheses 1 e to the negative three divided by four. And when I'm done with that, I get 125 Yes, 125.0 volts. Remember, this is volts per meter, and these are meters, so you just get volts out. So the uh, voltage across this went from what was just a flat 200 volts went down to 125 volts because the battery wasn't connected. It was free to do that. 
Any questions on that? Now that you have that, you can also calculate the capacitance. So let's find out what the new capacitance is. You know, if it was a regular capacitor where you'd filled the whole space with a capacitance, you'd expect the capacitance to go from 177 picofarads to what, uh, 668, 668 picofarads, four times 177. Uh, let me make that one clear because it's my red markers all over it. So uh, now let's calculate what the capacitance will be since it only, only filled in half the area. So you don't expect it to be the full four times 177, which I argued was 668 or something like that. Let's see, four times 177 is 708. I forgot to carry part of it. <laughs> That's really bad. Uh, anyways, so uh, part F is what is the capacitance, which we might call C prime or whatever. But originally we called C just C zero. So I'm just going to stick with the C for the final capacitance. So the final capacitance is the final charge divided by the final voltage. The final charge is in fact equal to the initial charge, but the final voltage is in fact quite different. So the initial charge we found was 35.40 times 10 to the negative nine coulombs. And now we're gonna divide that by 125.0 volts. So 35.40 e to the negative nine divided by 125 is equal to 283.2 times 10 to the negative 12th farads. And remember, nano is 10 to the negative twice, uh, 10 to the negative ninth. So pico is 10 to the negative 12th. So we can see C is equal to 283.2 with one extra sig fig picofarads. So it clearly, since the capacitor was originally 177 picofarads, it clearly went up. But remember, uh, C equals C times K zero would have been uh, 708 picofarads. So it's definitely smaller than that. Okay, now you're, uh, the problems at the end of the chapter do something like this where they fill it up halfway on the top and then maybe not on the bottom or they do a capacitor with a uh, dielectric in the top that's one dielectric and a different dielectric in the bottom and it spans the whole space you can treat that as two parallel capacitors by the way so that makes that a lot easier or you can do it with you know a dielectric here and then another different dielectric here and then you just basically say do the same thing we did with this voltage part but you got to calculate the electric field in this dielectric, then the electric field in this dielectric. And that's all related to the electric field that the capacitor had before the dielectric. Again, using those same formulas like E equals E zero uh, times one minus one over K. Okay. So that's it. That's the last of the questions or last of the examples I wanted to show you guys. Make sure y'all can calculate, you know, the force required to pull a a uh, capacitor plate apart, the force required to pull a capacitor or a dielectric out of a ca capacitor, that kind of stuff. Be able, I'm gonna write this in the note, uh, in this note here so everybody will have a chance to see it. Be able to calculate F to pull plates apart. R to pull out or push in a dielectric. Now be advised, there are gonna be instances where the dielectric would actually be sucked in all on its own. So the, the, the work done would be like a negative and therefore the force 
would actually be like you would have to keep it from happening. So just be keep in mind that under certain circumstances, you stick a dielectric near it, it's going to try to suck it in. And then, of course, it's going to do work on you to get it in. So that that's something you want to be able to understand. Uh, same thing with the plates of a capacitor. Sometimes they want to come together because obviously they're oppositely charged. Other times they want to uh, spread apart under certain scenarios, uh, specifically with dielectric. So keep that in mind. But these are some other things you should be able to do. I think your book, uh, I know your book has them, but the uh, practice test as well as the uh, some of the homeworks might, but I know the practice test has some like that. So anybody have any questions on that? Because our time's up. Negative, sir. I have a question. Um, did that correspond with like a question in the textbook? Yeah, this was almost uh, the very last example in, in Gene Coley's book is almost identical to this. And the next to the last example is almost identical to the one I did before today, uh, earlier today, this one. So, yeah, they're, they're definitely related or like the problems that Gene Coley did. I just don't want to use Gene Coley's examples uh, because this goes on my YouTube and I might get in trouble for that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Like I said, you guys are free to go. I'll wait here for the last person to leave, and then I'm going to my next class. Thank you, Professor. You're Have welcome. Thank you for coming. I'll try to get these notes and videos up as soon as possible. Oh, and just to clarify, you said we have till Sunday for the test for the. Yes, uh, I'll open it up today, and you should have until Sunday. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Have a good one, guys. I had a quick question about the homework. So the homework is due tomorrow night. Will that right. be extended a little bit later or is that still going to stay then? Uh, it's going to stay there. If, if it's for okay. chapter 24, it'll stay where it is. Okay. I was just making sure. Yeah. Thank you. 25 can change, but not 24. Gotcha. Patrick, I'm sorry I left you out there in the waiting room for so long. Oh, it looks like you're still trying to connect, uh, at least from an audio standpoint. But uh, letting you know, I, I saw you up there, but I don't know how long you'd been in the waiting room before I let you in. I apologize if it took a while. So I'm sure you probably had already come in, but uh, got knocked out for internet service or Wi-Fi or whatever. So uh, if you can type a chat, uh, let me know if you have any questions. If not, I'm going to go ahead and sign it out because it's acting like you not, might not even be there or be able to hear me. All right. I'm out of here. Have a good day.